Are we? Are we okay? Are we good? We do okay. All right. So, uh, um, it, it's fine. It's fine here. It's fine. Um, so, uh, so this week uh, we're back, and I was told I needed to wear some some ears, so I got some ears on. Um, and uh, uh, the reader comment uh, post we made or second post, I don't know, but uh, but Stephanie asked about Nazis, so I figured. Uh, I could probably talk about Nazis any day of the week, so here we are. So we're gonna talk about Nazis. Um, as always, shout out when you're in the um, comments, and my executive producer will um, let me know. And if you have a question, ask in the comments. I'll try to answer it. And uh, if you got ideas for topics, um, you know, make make a po make a comment on Facebook, and we'll we'll include them because this is a reader topic from um, from Stephanie, um, Stephanie D. Uh, right, and so. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so Nazism. I'm going to talk about them. And and uh, my EP, Dara, suggested like not so much Hitler, but more like the Nazis more broadly, which is not a bad suggestion because they typically get ignored. So, um, so let's talk about the the Nazi part. Right? So the thing you got to understand is um, like like it's like fascism, right? The, the Nazi political ideology of fascism, right? So fascism of um, a left-wing labor, like trade union stuff in France. And there's a guy named George Sorel, who was, uh, the, I love the term, he's an anarcho-syndicalist. Um, and he pioneered this kind of militant, kind of really aggressive, uh, very hierarchical organizational scheme for the parties. And uh, that became the kind of, the, the sort of structural basis of fascism. And then in the 20s in Italy, uh, Benito Mussolini, was the uh, the uh, uh, former left wing, but then later right wing guy who took over the Italian government? And what Mussolini did was he took Sorelian left wing anarcho syndicalism labor organization, and he married ultra militaristy new kids. Right, he put the he put the right wing stuff in the in the wing. Uh, yeah. Just I want you to hang on a second. I'm going to take you off the screen because yeah. they're frozen. Yeah. You froze like this. Oh. So I. Oh. I to, uh, Can you unfreeze it? Can you hear? Can you unfreeze it? Can you hear? Am I coming through with the? Um, I mean, I don't know you if you are or not, but hang on while okay. I. It's cool. Okay. okay. It's cool. Drink. <sighs> Getting everybody drunk there while I mess with my camera. Let me get you back in frame. Yeah, well, they can see you now. Sideways. Sideways. Give it a second. Give it a second. <laughs> there we go. Woo, 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 woo. All right, you may continue. Right. Did so did the first part of it come through with the, the voice and stuff? You know? Do we know? Anyway, it's, still, it's still a little uh, right-wing things in a left-wing box. All right. All right. So, 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 that's, so yeah, that's what you have been choppy so far, but people are saying, oh, I, I'm sorry. I haven't turned my mic off. That's why he's echoing. OK. So people are saying they got it. I can I can continue. Yeah, just go slowly because it's it's uh. Okay, so I don't know how to do that. Um, so, um. Oh my god. Okay, should I do that? All right. So, um, is it still choppy? A little bit. A little bit. Lag. I mean lag. Lag. Uh, and so. So, all right, so it's Mussolini who is the guy that repackages this kind of left-wing um, uh, uh, labor organizing strategy into a, with a, with a right-wing kind of content. And Hitler and the Nazis are going to copy that, right? But so to turn to Germany now, the sort of defining thing that you have to understand, I think, about fascism and Nazism in Germany is that after World War One, it's just total chaos. There's There's no, there's no like certainty or stability in the society at all, uh, right? And so, um, you, you, World War One happens. It, it, Germany goes broke, uh, paying for it, and then also with the reparations is the Versailles Treaty afterward, right? And then, of course, millions of people die. Spanish flu comes in and kills a lot more. Uh, Spanish flu is actually French flu, but the French clamp down on news of the flu spreading in France. So the first reports anybody gets of it are in Spain, which I call the Spanish flu, right? And arguably, Spanish flu killed as many people as World War One did worldwide. Uh, right. So, I mean, you got that. It's like a kick in the teeth. Hey, we just killed a bunch of people in World War One. Oh, also flu, whatever. Uh, and so uh, you understand in post-World War One Germany, it's everything is kind of thrown into chaos. 
the, um, the emperor has abdicated and fled the country. The military, which was the one stable institution. Hey, girls, I'm going to take the balloon away. If we can't play nice with the balloon. Um, all right, sorry, we have a balloon fight. Uh, but in a, in a, not in a fun way. Um, and so uh, the military, which was the one kind of unifying institution uh, in uh, Germany up to that point, has been totally discredited, right? I mean, the, the military lost this war uh, and the, the um, I'm sorry, we had a balloon. Now we have a balloon tragedy. And so um, the, the military is like the one serious institution. Uh, what are people saying? What? What would, what would Hitler, what would Hitler do? Ashley is saying that that's what Hitler would do. She would take the, he would take the balloon away. Well, I mean, we had to do it because they were fighting over the balloon. It was, it was, it was for peaceful reasons. Who is Ashley? That's your well, I mean, I'm sorry, Ashley, but we can't have balloons. Um, and so, all right. So the military is kind of totally gone. And basically all the institutions that have held Germany together and have been used for like 50 years to kind of build a Germany um, are, are gone. Oh, we're experiencing technical difficulties. I'm sorry, the, the screaming kid in the background is adding to the ambiance. All right, so um, my executive producer's on it. She's on the job. Um, and so having said that, um, Germany's like kind of in total chaos, right? Uh, the major right-wing political parties are basically in total disarray because they were associated with the war and everybody, I mean, they lost, right? The left-wing parties on the other side politically, they um, – they took over the country at when the, uh, the, the emperor abdicated and the military lost the war, but now they're associated with the Versailles Treaty, um, which is, is viewed by everyone in Germany, as you might imagine, as a tremendously unfair, kind of terrible thing. So, you know, where do you turn, right? What political parties are left? Well, of course, people go to the extremes and they go on the, on the left. They look at the, um, the German Communist Party, uh, which is the KPD. Uh, or they look at the Socialist Party, the SPD, uh, Socialist Party Deutschland, uh, and those guys start picking up recruits, uh, which is, you know, Germany's an industrialist country, the socialist communist, good for the workers and whatever, right? On the other hand, on the right wing, you have uh, this kind of really diffuse amount of these groups of, of parties that are just kind of popping up all over the place. And a lot of demobilized veterans, by the way, um, join these kind of right wing militias that they call uh, Freikorps, Free Corps. And they basically just form these kind of right wing militias full of weapons from from World War One. And they start going around, you know, trying to like set things right. Right. I mean, they go attack communists. They go beat up people they don't like. They go invade Poland to try to recover territory the German government has, has lost. And, and so it's this really kind of chaotic thing. Right. And uh, there's all these political parties kind of popping up all over the place. But there is a common theme uniting them uh, what the Germans call the super right wing kind of nationalist groups, and they tend to become sort of associated with a great deal of racism, uh, right? The Germans call them uh, the Volkish movement, which is sort of like the, uh, we would call today like the, the, the sort of racial nationalist movement or something like that, right? And so these Volkish movement guys are pretty right wing, they're pretty heavily armed, and there's kind of a lot of them. And it, it, it's in this, this sort of right wing milieu that the Nazi party is formed. Uh, right, that, that this party kind of emerges. Uh, and one of the leaders is a guy named Anton Drexler. Is there a question? question? Okay. Uh, Drexler, yeah, I mean, Drexler is a, well, I mean, he's a stooge. Um, so I remember correctly, Drexler, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said they're heavily armed, but I thought they were. You said the groups are heavily armed, but I thought they had to disarm themselves after World War One. Yeah, um, so. Um, the, the, the technically the German government was obligated to disarm itself. They didn't really try very hard. Um, and a lot of people ended up walking away with weapons. And so like the civilian weapon market is flooded with military surplus. And my favorite story is in, um, in Bavaria, which had its own kind of separate administration from the rest of Germany in those days. The Bavarian government had its own army. And, and in fact, Hitler served as, a, as a, a corporal in the Bavarian army, not in the German army, which is sort of subsidiary to the German army as a whole. And so what the Bavarian government did is it took all of its weapons and turned it over to a corporation, 
Uh, they, they created a dummy corporation. They gave all the weapons. And they, ostensibly, the corporation was supposed to sell it overseas to make cash that they would use to pay the reparations. In fact, the guy in charge of the corporation was named Ernst Rome. And Rome routinely just gave stuff to, um, uh, to like, right-wing people he liked, like Nazis and stuff. Uh, and they called him the Machine Gun King. Because if you need, like, anybody need a gun, you need to hook up. We know this dude, Rome. And you just, you know, walk up to Rome with some cash. And, like, he would just, oh, some crates are going to fall off a truck on Tuesday night or whatever. And you get some rifles. You get some submachine guns. You get a machine gun or whatever you want. Um, and so, and Rome ends up becoming a Nazi, actually. Uh, becomes one of the major bankrollers of the Nazi movement. Until it turns out he's politically difficult. And they, um, they shoot him. Uh, and they use, if he's gay, so they use that against him. They're like, well, we can't have that. Um, and so the great story is they, they, Hitler's cleaning house um, in the 30s. And they, they come in with Rome and they put a, a gun on the table with one bullet. And they're like, you know what to do. And Rome is like, I'm not going to do that. And so then they come back in and they take the gun and shoot him. Uh, and they're like, fine, you know, we'll, we'll do it. Um, hey, Sarah, can you not miss the, but thank you. Um, um, uh, I, I just want to share this comment with you. Stephanie says, Matt loves to speak German like Alex Trebek and Bert speaking French Canadian on Jeopardy. She also knows that it's very weird to call you Matt. It's pretty weird. It's weird. Yeah, it's, it's Stephanie usually calls me like Mr. Giddings Rev was former student. Um, so I don't think it's weird to call me Max. I call myself that all the time when I talk in the third person, which is a totally normal thing to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh, I'm super smart and I have to be respectful of myself. So, um, it, so Drexler is the guy that kind of, there's a couple of parties that are technically like the ancestors of the Nazis with, they have like these weird names or whatever, but Drexler is associated with the Nazi party and he's in, um, he's in, uh, Munich. Uh, and Munich in Germany, in Bavaria, is this really kind of like militarized, kind of right-wing, kind of crazy city. And Drexler is um, uh, Drexler is is sort of in charge of the kind of uh, the the uh, the German Workers' Party is what it's called, uh, the Deutsche Arbeiter Partei, right? And so it's this is what Hitler comes into uh, when he joins the party in uh, like the early twenties, uh, like right after the end of, of World War One, uh, and so. The, um, the, um, uh, uh, what am I saying? And so, uh, Hitler, of course, remember, had been recruited by the German military to basically be like a spy to go check on all these new parties and provide like intelligence updates on the parties to the, um, uh, to the German military. And so, one of the parties he goes and recruits on is the, is the German Workers' Party, the DAP, right? And Hitler decides that he likes the cut of their jib, so he joins the party. And I want to say they, they get him a membership card, and he's member 555, which, of course, is fake because they started printing the, the, the cards at 500, uh, right? They don't actually have 555 members. They have, like, 20, right? And so uh, the Nazi party then is sort of one of a whole number of um, right-wing parties in this kind of heavily armed, kind of very racialized, uh, very politicized, kind of militarized environment in Germany. And again, remember, everything is kind of crazy. The government is sort of totally discredited. The new constitution is like a couple years old. The, the war has just lost and territory has been, been uh, taken away and the, the, the emperor's gone. And kind of everything is sort of uh, kind of being questioned. And on the one hand, it's this great moment in Germany. Uh, the new government is called the Weimar Republic because they wrote a constitution in the city of Weimar in eastern Germany. And that's where they founded the new government. But in the Weimar, on one hand, is this really kind of progressive, experimental time. There's all these great artists. Uh, there's a lot of um, a sort of like um, uh, sexual liberation in the very conservative uh, parts of Germany. Uh, there's a really good book called uh, Berlin Alexander Platz about the kind of really like libertine um, sort of progressive culture in Berlin. Uh, and of course, you can see Cabaret is a great musical about what it was like in Weimar for people who were, were left wing. Yeah. Uh, Karen would like to know why it is called the Workers' Party, which she associates with the left wing, but it's it's right wing. Uh, the simple thing is that kind of name, uh, you know, had legs, right? I mean, like it's a, uh, and of course the trick is, the, the important thing is everybody wants to attract workers because there's a lot of workers, am I right? But it's not the Workers' Party, which would be a left wing name. It's the German Workers' Party, and the inclusion of German automatically tells you it's a right-wing party because, remember, the left-wing parties are transnational, right? The socialists uh, are very, you know, we're bigger than one country, right? Uh, remember what, uh, what they said, the socialists said, is that well, the, what's the only thing at both ends of a rifle? And the answer is a worker, uh, right? And so you're going to shoot another guy in the trenches in World War I. He's a worker just like you, and you got more in common with him because you're a worker and he's a worker than you do with the exploitive landowner class that's taking you guys both for a ride, right? And so the, the specific in inclusion of nationalism is what really sort of tells you that this is a party of trying to attract a lot of people 
who are sort of unsure. You know, there's a lot of there's a, a sort of boom, you might say, in political activism. So you got all these workers who don't maybe know what their views are, and you're trying to appeal to them, put worker in the name, right? Uh, but uh, if it was a left wing party, it would have just been the workers' party. But if it's a right wing party, this is the German workers' party, right? Um, and so, having said that, uh, what can we say about that? So there's a whole bunch of, of groups out there. There's um, the uh, the Steel Helmets is a big one. The Stahlheim. They're like a veterans organization of World War II veterans or World War One veterans, very right wing. There's a whole umbrella organization for some of the Volkish groups called the uh, Reichskriegsflagge, the Imperial War Banner, and they make a point of marching under the old um, red, white, black German flag from 1871 to 1917, uh, whereas the new German government uses the liberal flag from 1848 that is the red, um, orange, black of the modern day German flag, right? And so uh, the, the new flag is associated with the old German liberalism. And so the uh, Reichskriegsflagge, this sort of really right-wing organization, uh, Fang is horking himself under the, under the pillow. So... Uh, we don't, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't want to know what's going on under there. It's just having, just having a moment. It's fine. Everything's fine. And so uh, the, the Reichskriegsflagge marches under this kind of deliberately provocative, you know, World War One era military banner, right? It's sort of like, this is what we are about, right? And so it is in this atmosphere in, uh, in Munich, the Nazi party kind of does pretty good. They, they end up recruiting a lot of people. They've got this new guy, Adolf Hitler, who is this really good speaker, is very charismatic. He's able to get a great draw. People rallies. He sells a lot of propaganda posters and um, and uh, and like uh, tickets for things and stuff. And so uh, that that makes money. And Hitler stages a takeover of the Munich wing of the party. Fang, Olivia, it's fine. It's Olivia. You're cool. Go back to it. It's cool. Cool. Nobody's gonna bother you. Um, and, and so. Um, uh, Hitler rapidly becomes like a big draw in the Munich wing of the party, and he basically stages a takeover. He more or less tells them, look, I could go form my own party with the Hitler party and do whatever I want, and then you guys wouldn't make any money, and you wouldn't have any draw, and you'd just be back to renting this crappy room. And uh, the rest of the party is like, no, 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 no. And Drexler is not thrilled about this, but I mean, you can't deny that the party, is, you know, it's this dog-eat-dog -dog world. There's a hundred new political parties every week. Uh, you know, either you, you get members and you recruit and you make money or you just get absorbed by somebody else. And so, I mean, they basically have to keep Hitler around. I mean, they basically have to, to sort of keep him around. And so the initial uh, program of the Nazi party, they have like a platform. It's very left-wing. It's, it's, it's very much, if you read it, you really think these are some socialist guys. And again, Karen mentioned the workers in the name. It does have some left-wing stuff going on. They talk about like nationalizing key industries and guaranteed sick leave um, and, uh, you know, talking about all this kind of left-wing stuff and sh health insurance and stuff. Um, and they talk about all these kind of left-wing programs to help workers. Um, and Hitler is sort of happy to just let that ride uh, for, for, for a while, right? He's happy to just kind of let that sort of happen, right? And they recruit some pretty famous people. Um, actually, um, in, in no particular time order, but they, they attract some, some interesting guys. Um, the most, the most uh, interesting in this early stage, there's really two, uh, is a World War I era uh, Air Force ace, Hermann Goering. Uh, and Goering was this kind of really creepy, like sleazy dude who had uh, got an ace in World War I. He'd killed five Allied, knocked down five Allied planes. Uh, and in the meantime, he married a very wealthy uh, widow after the war, and uh, she left her enormous fortune at his disposal. Um, and in later years, Goering would turn out to be this kind of really hedonistic, kind of um, debauched individual. During World War, um, during World War uh, II, he spent a lot of time redesigning his enormous hunting mansion, Karin Hall. Uh, which had all these stolen art pieces and like Van Gogh paintings and stuff that they got from France. And he designed the, he was the head of the German Air Force and he designed all their uniforms and awarded himself all these medals. And he was this big rotund, like overweight guy, like this sort of obese guy with all these ridiculous medals on his sash. Um, dude, Fang, really? We don't need, no, you don't need to share your experience with us. Um, and so he's like, but it's, I'm, I'm learning my body. Um, and so, I mean, that's, Mm, sure. Um, and so, uh, and Gehring actually got hooked on, among other things, um, opium and I think morphine. And ironically, when they, when they dried him out in 1945, um, in the Nuremberg trials, he actually sobered up and he lost like 200 pounds in jail. And he actually mounted such a good defense at the Nuremberg trials that he probably would have been able to acquit himself. But he realized that the Allies were never going to let that happen, so he committed suicide instead. And, and, and observers of the trial were like, this guy is like 10 times smarter than anybody thought he was. 
and all of the allied, um, you know, all the allied propaganda in World War II had stressed the fact that he was this kind of doofus incompetent, which he sort of was. He was all drugged out all the time. But, but Goering joins the Nazi party early on and sort of gravitates to Hitler, who's got this magnetic personality. And for Hitler, uh, the people that were in the party for a long time, he called them his, uh, what he called them, old fighters, alt comforts. And they were like his go-to buddies. And Goering, uh, importantly, was loyal to Hitler until the very end. I mean, he, was, he never wavered. Because other people like Rome or whoever who tried to build a power base, you know, Hitler would just get rid of them, but, but not Goering. Um, and so the, the other guy they got actually was a German army general named Erich von Ludendorff. Uh, and Ludendorff had actually served as the German commander of the German attack into France in 1914. Um, and had led the German army into France um, and had stalled out in September uh, on the Marne River, not able to defeat the French enough to capture Paris. And that was what led to the stalemate that led to the trenches and led to um, the awful fighting and the awful bloodshed on the Western Front. Um, Ludendorff actually had a nervous breakdown about two weeks before the fateful Battle of the Marne in September 1914. And he just froze and just panicked and just had the stress got to him. And every general who ever has this happen says, you should quit. You should, you should, pick, you should turn over command. It happens, the same thing happens in the 1863 Battle of Chancellorsville to um, fighting Joe Hooker, who gets hit with an artillery shell and gets a concussion but insist that he should remain in command, even though he's completely out of it. And afterwards, he was like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. And it's like, well, you know, thanks for the saying now, right? And uh, the doctor actually treats Ludendorff for exhaustion and a, um, a, 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 a nervous uh, a collapse and is like, yeah, you should listen to military marches and rest for eight hours. You should, you should listen to military marches for eight hours a day and then sleep the rest of the day, uh, which is like a, a weird... A weird prescription, but like, okay, whatever. And so Ludendorff is kind of looking for um, some, he's sort of at less lost ends. I mean, the, the military's been disbanded or shrunk to like a tenth of its previous size. He's not exactly got a lot of luster on his medals after 1918 when they lost. And, and even though he won some of the big battles of the war, a Tannenberg, uh, was the big battle that the Germans won on the Eastern Front, where they named it as the name of a medieval Russian victory as a big F.U. to the Russians. Uh, that was Ludendorff who helped to do that. It was very bold. Um, but by the 20s, he was kind of this loser. So he kind of joins the Nazi party, and they love him because they can kind of trot him out and be like, yeah, this is our general, Ludendorff. You may have heard of him. It's a pretty big deal. You know, We're not just a bunch of weirdos. Look at this guy. You know, um, And so they love Ludendorff because he's like their, their pet general, right? There's, there's their, pet, uh, their pet guy, right? Uh, and so... Uh, the Nazis have this kind of weird collection of like um, uh, uh, sort of like disgruntled right wing guys and connections with the militia movement and like military weapons suppliers and like generals and like this weird collection of, of crazies at the top. And we also should mention that there's a lot of research in the, the 20s, especially. Ah, drinks. Oh, drinks. Uh, where there's almost like this. Um, this this need for extremism among some people in Germany, like like the, the, the communists have their bully squad called the Red Front, Rot Front, uh, right? And they beat the crap out of people they don't like, and they're all big tough dudes in overalls, and they kick butt. And so the um, the um, the uh, Nazis decide that they need their own protection squad too, and so they form one called the Sturmabteilung, which is called the Stormtroopers, and originally it was the Sports Auxiliary Section, and they were all like. When it's not a goon squad, we're going to do calisthenics or whatever. Um, and it's a goon squad, right? I mean, come on. Uh, and so, and uh, by the way, the Sturmab Tiling is, you know, they have uh, brown pants um, and they, they wear um, like these mustard colored shirts. They call them the brown shirts sometimes. And the funny thing is the brown shirts all come from, they need a uniform uh, for these new guys they're going to have in the Nazi party. They're going to line them up in front of the speaking stage. It's going to look all badass. When the Red Front shows up, we're going to beat the crap out of those commie bastards, you know, whatever. And so they need a uniform, and it's, like, expensive. And finally, a guy is like, um, somebody's like, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who could get us a warehouse full of Polish Army uniforms from World War One. And they're like, I mean, call your cousin, I guess, or whatever. And so they get this truckload of Polish Army shirts, and they're this mustard orange-yellow. It's this hideous color. But they tell everybody who's going to come to the Nazi rally, right, they're like, just wear pants, like dark pants. And, like, we'll give you a shirt, right? And then so all the guys show up in undershirts, and they get this yellow shirt, which becomes, like, the trademark of the, the, the stormtroopers, right? And it's this completely random kind of happenstance there. Because uh, Mussolini in, in Italy had his black shirts, and they all look smart in their little black shirt uniforms and their black pants. Uh, is there any comments? Any comments? I'm just laughing because Evan said they had the right idea by wearing, by wearing brown pants. Ooh, brown pants. Ooh, it's a poop joke. Well, I mean, they're not going to like that, but then again... 
uh, they're losers. So, um, but the, the thing is, uh, it turns out when you do a research into these guys, a lot of these guys kind of went back and forth between the left and the right wing groups. They were just looking for action. They were just looking for uh, sort of fame, adventure, a name for themselves. You know, there's a whole theory, horseshoe theory, that when you go extreme enough on the left or right wing, it kind of loops back around to itself. And I don't know if I believe that. I just think a lot of these guys weren't, they didn't really care about ideas. They just were looking for something to put their name into. Acceptance is a good way to look at it. You know, validation. I mean, they just were, they didn't know what to do. Everything is in chaos. You can join these groups. They seem cool. All your friends are there. And so a lot of the Red Front SA guys, the storm I'm telling you, the brown shirts that sort of they call them SA, uh, the, a lot of them go back and forth. They, they switch membership a bunch of times, uh, right? And, and it doesn't, it seems like if you were a dedicated Nazi, you would not become a communist. But again, it doesn't seem like these guys really cared very much about the details. They were just looking to beat people up. And here, we're going to give you a uniform. We're going to give you a billy club. You're going to stand in front of this guy talking, and a bunch of people are going to try to wreck his meeting, and you're just beat the shit out of him. And... Uh, you're like, okay, and then, like, we'll buy you beer afterwards or whatever. Like, you get drunk afterwards. Um, and so, like, there was this whole kind of underworld of sort of crazy politics in Germany in that period. And so the big thing the Nazis tried to do is Hitler basically tries to emulate Mussolini. What if we just take over the Bavarian government and we just go in there and we just take it over and um, it would be rad, all right? So, nailed it. And so um, the... Um, there we go. Uh, the... Um, uh, in uh, in uh, 1919, in Munich, there had been a communist uprising, and a lot of left-wing organizers had armed the, the communists, uh, and they had tried to take over the government, and they did, uh, right? And um, they took over the government, and they proclaimed a left-wing communist government. This is like right at the aftermath of World War I, uh, and it was called the Spartacists. They were named for Spartacus, the, um, uh, the probably Greek slave who fought in the uh, Third Servile War in the first century BC in ancient Rome. And remember, Spartacus um, led a slave revolt that crossed uh, the Straits of Messina from Sicily to southern Rome, and then he got jacked up by the Roman military, led by, among others, Pompey the Great and Crassus. And remember, they crucified all the slaves uh, one per mile on the Via Appia, the Appian Way, going up from Naples to Rome as a message like the other slaves, right? And so the, the left wing... Um, uh, German KPD, they, they sort of like named their, their republic after Spartacus because like we are also revolting slaves, but we're slaves of the capitalists or whatever. Uh, and so what happened is the German military had not been disbanded all the way yet. Versailles Treaty had not been enforced yet. And so everybody kind of looked the other way and was like, we just, you know, you just handle it and we'll just like, I don't know, whatever. And so the German military went in there and just, they just killed all those people. Um, and the leaders of German communism were uh, a nice group of people, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, and uh, they shot him. Uh, I mean, that was, and that was that. I mean, it was, it was very, very brutal, very ugly stuff. And so um, Hitler was like, look, you know, these guys did it. We can do it. And Mussolini had done the same thing. He marched on Rome and basically made so much noise and such an ass of himself and threatened so much that the government, they, they, gave, they let him into the government. They, they, put, they gave him a cabinet ministry. Uh, and he used that as his springboard to power. And so Hitler's like, we can do the same thing. I mean, we're, we're, we're at least as competent as Mussolini and the Spartacists, am I right? Um, and so, okay, right, they're going to try to do the same thing in 1923. And so all, all year long, the Nazis are, like, making a bunch of noise, and there's parades, and they're getting permits, and the city's restricting them, and Hitler's throwing tantrums. And finally, in November, they, they launched their master plan. They, um, they in the, in the, uh, uh, the Burger Brau Keller, which is like a beer house, a beer hall, uh, Hitler jumps up on the table and he fires a pistol into the ceiling. And apparently you can see the bullet hole in the ceiling if you go. They, um, Hitler announces, like, we're going to take over Munich. We're just going to do it. And so uh, the next day, they all drive down to the city square. And they all get out there in the Filtherenhalle is the square. And they march up to the Berlin or the Munich city government. And they've all got their guns and stuff. And they're, like, ready to just take over and institute a, a Nazi dictatorship in Bavaria. And the German police and the military, are they're like, they're there, they're there. And when they see these guys come in, they're like, uh, well, we're not just going to let you. So they open fire. Um, and the whole thing just kind of falls apart. Just like, uh, why are you laughing? Because the, um, the, the camera flipped and like, lost connection to you for a minute. And then they're just looking at me watching the screen. <laughs> Uh, is it is it okay now? Yes. All right. Uh, make sure that you give good reactions so that they know that what they're listening to is awesome because this is yeah double thumbs up. 
Uh, right. Uh, and so uh, what happens in, in, in uh, November 9th, 1923 is, is the day. They call it the Beer Hall Putsch, uh, right? And it's this sort of big moment for Hitler where the army is like, uh, we're not just going to let you do it. They shoot. And so um, the, the Nazis melt like, you know, they melt like ice in the sun, right? And everybody's just like, oh, fuck this. Nobody's ever going to get shot at. And so um, there's uh, Hitler and Gehring. Gehring, actually, I think it's shot in the leg, I want to say, or the arm. And uh, like, and he was standing next to Hitler. And so, I mean, if a bullet had been a couple of feet one way or the other, like he might have killed Hitler. And so, uh, they jump, they jump Hitler in the car, and they get him out of there. And Ludendorff is in his full World War One uniform, and so he doesn't know what to do. He's all like, "I can't run away." So he just like squares his back and just like marches across the, the plaza. And and then like he reaches the police, and the police are like, "You're under arrest." And he's like, "Okay." And they're like, "Uh, okay." And and that's it. Like he doesn't he doesn't know he can't run away. He can't not do. So he just marches across the plaza like I don't give a shit. Um, and they they're like, okay, well, you are under arrest, you know, Herr General or whatever. So there's this huge treason trial because it's like holy shit, the Nazis tried to take over Bavaria, right? And it's like wow. And so, God, drinks. And so, um, having said that. Uh, the trial, as you might imagine, is a huge deal. I mean, like, imagine if some dude tried to take over the government of an American state. Like, we would all watch the crap out of that, right? And so, what? Uh, what? Uh, with the, with the? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, though, I mean, those losers took over a wildlife refuge. Wasn't that like Oregon or? It was Oregon. It was, in Oregon. It was, it was yeah, the Malheur Wildlife. Refuge. And then a bunch of people on the internet mailed them gallon-sized drums of lube and like double-headed dildos and stuff. And it was like, "Welcome to 2020. Nothing is serious. You just look like an idiot." It was like 2017. I know, whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, but imagine if they like those guys like occupied the state government and attempted to shoot the governor and stuff. It would be that would be a trial we would all be watching on CNN, right? Hopefully Nancy Grace would cover it better than she did. Uh, what's your face, Casey Anthony? Yeah. Okay, so Stephanie just said, "I just heard yesterday Hitler was in the same helicopter and bomb kicked in the bottle of liquor, but the bomb failed." Yeah, yeah. In, in much later in World War II, they tried to assassinate Hitler, and they put um, they they one of the plans to assassinate him was they put two con cognac bottles. Like the, the general said, oh, we want to send these to Hitler because uh, they're like two cognac bottles. And Hitler did not drink. He did not smoke. He did not drink. He didn't eat red meat. He was vegetarian. He loved animals. Um, and so, uh, and, he, and he painted bad. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, okay. Winston Churchill painted about as good as Hitler, and Churchill didn't think he was good at all. Uh, right? But um, the, the idea was they, they put these in a, in a package to give to him as like a symbol of their esteem, but hidden in the package was a bomb, and it had a pressure switch that would go off when the plane reached cruising altitude and then count down like a four hour timer. So the idea would be like, they would go in a car and it would get delivered to Hitler. And then like, you know, they would carry it into the right chancellery and he would open it up and it would be uh, two bo you know, two bottles and it would go off, right? And uh, the, the switch failed. And so when the bomb didn't go off, they just gave Hitler the bottles and he was like, great, thanks, I don't drink and put them on a shelf. And then the, they just got rid of the bomb. And so it's not a helicopter, it was a plane, and Hitler wasn't on the plane. They were, it was delivered to him, but the bomb did not go off. Uh, this would have been, I think, 43 or 44. Yeah, September 44 is the big bombing attempt where uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg uh, takes the bomb into the Wolfschanze, the, the, the bunker, Wolfler, and he puts the bomb under the table and arms it. And then the table's a big concrete, it's like a 25-foot wide table with these big concrete legs, and they're setting the map up for Hitler to come, to, and he's going to stand right over the bomb, and it's going to blow his legs off. And one of the guys keeps kicking the thing, and he's like, whose briefcase is this? And they're like, oh, it's Stauffenberg's. So he moves it on the other side of the concrete table leg. And when the bomb goes off, most of the blast goes into the side of the room, and it saves Hitler's life. Yeah. And Hitler, by the way, he hung those people with piano wire, and then they filmed it, and he watched the films over and over again until he committed suicide. So there's a lot of conversation going on in the comments about um, uh, Indiana Jones and uh, yeah, yeah. for yeah. this artifact, yeah. and like, Bernie commented, she's like, you always hear those references in pop culture. I'm not already looking for biblical, art mm -hmm. biblical artifacts. He has no idea how accurate any of them Oh, yeah, let's talk about it. So, um, um, let me get some drinks. I'm getting a little drunk. It's getting fun. Um, <laughs> who am I? Uh, so, anyway, anyway, um, the, the, the reference, of course, is Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they go looking for the Ark of the Covenant. In, um, in, in Egypt, and uh, Indiana Jones finds it, but the Nazis steal it, and then they take it to uh, Corfu or wherever in the Mediterranean, and they open it and it melts everyone's face, right? Um, and the, the, the story is, of course, if Indiana Jones had done nothing, 
the Nazis probably would have eventually found it and taken it to, to Berlin and Hitler would have opened it and died, right? And so the moral of the story is Steven Spielberg is bad at, at writing plots, but that's like the first movie he ever did or whatever, uh, right? I don't know what you're talking about. There's only three Indiana Jones movies. There's the moderately okay first one, the mediocre second one, and the good third one. Um, and then the third one was uh, third one is great, uh, right? A penitent man will kneel before God. Uh, and so, um, having said that, um, I remembered my Charlemagne, uh, uh, right? Uh, even though that's not a poem Charlemagne wrote, and it has why would Charlemagne write a poem? Why would a ninth century French king write a poem about birds? Uh, right? You could, he could have said something totally different, like I remembered by Plutarch or whatever, right? Uh, so anyway, um, so there's this whole story about the Nazis being interested in like occult stuff, right? And so uh, two, a couple things. First, the Nazis come out of this kind of really weird German historical tradition, which is frankly nuts. There was a guy, Alfred Rosenberg, who wrote a book called uh, Der Myth des uh, 20. Jahrhunderts, The Myth of the 20th Century. And it was about how like there are all these races, and they all the races compete. It's very Darwinian, right? Where the human race is divided into sub races, and the sub races compete ruthlessly for resources. And you either a loser or a winner race, and winner races expand, and loser races get jacked up. And uh, the races can be ranked in, in hierarchy. And surprise, surprise, the hierarchy goes from white people to black, you know, to blacker people. To black. And so this book was so great that when Hitler uh, got in power, he appointed Rosenberg to be like, Rosenberg is a Nazi and became like a, a big deal in the Nazi party, right? And there were all these weird conspiracy theories about like uh, all this mystical stuff about um, the, where, the, where the mysterious white race came from. And, and it comes from this place called Ultima Thule, which is basically Scandinavia. And the reality is the Aryans, uh, with the term Aryan, is a bunch of Caucasian dudes from the Caucasus in the like 2000s BC who migrated to northern India and basically created Hinduism with the locals. And they're not, they're not white. They, they would have been not white, but whatever. But the, the, the German right wing got fixated on this, this whole theory of history that it was all racial conflict and strong races were producing and weak races and, uh, and anti-Semitism comes in. But it's not religious anti-Semitism because the Jews killed Jesus. It's not that. It, the Jews are a separate race of evil humans, right? They're like a separate racial category. Um, According to the Nazis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like the traditional anti-Semitism in Europe was that the Jews were bad because they killed Jesus. But the, the Nazis don't care about that. That's not a good reason to hate Jews if you don't believe in any of that crap, right? And so for them, they, they have this idea that instead the Jews are this kind of separate, culture-destroying, parasitic race. Right? And so the Nazis are there's, – there's a lot of this like weird occult stuff in Nazism in terms of the ideas that they end up glomming onto, right? And then into that, you get guys like Heinrich Himmler. Himmler is a education uh, like major in college and a chicken farmer and a loser. And he ends up in the Nazis in the mid twenties and he rises to the top. And when the SA kind of goes out later, they bring in the Schutzenstaffel, the SS, uh, which are the black shirts. They wear the black uniforms. Um, Hugo Boss tailors the uniforms. So just remember that when you buy a suit and um, the, uh, the uh, Hitler's real uh, Himmler is really into this, like a cult sort of like, He's very into Nietzsche, the idea that like Christianity is a religion that has allowed uh, the Western culture to become suffused with suffering and like the 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 um, the elevation of suffering is like an ideal form of, of human life. And like that poor people are great and they're like losers should be taken care of. Or, and Nietzsche is not interested in that. He argues that like. You know, to put it bluntly, like a book by a guy named Robert Kagan, leadership demands a pagan ethos, right? We need worship strong gods that want strong men, not like weak gods that elevate suffering. And so Himmler's big into that, and he looks for a way as head of the SS to create and create this racially pure social elite that will replace the Christian rituals of culture with pagan rituals. So they're all into like, I worship Thor, and I'm into Nazi runes, and like ancient runes, and we don't celebrate Christmas, so like Yule, and at one point they banned the celebration of Christmas among SS officers. You have to basically be pagan to be in the SS. And so that's where all this obsession with this occult stuff comes into. And Himmler does do some of this stuff before World War One. They are, or two, they are looking for like, I don't know why they would look for the Ark of the Covenant. It's a Jewish relic. Why would he? Why would he want a relic of the Jews? It's dis It's. I would not want. The, if you're a real Nazi, you would not want such a disgusting thing, a perverted thing, even to be in your presence, uh, right? Uh, the the most accurate line uh, in. Um, uh, um, the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is when the, the SS guy is watching the he, the, the, the archaeologist comes out dressed as a Jewish priest to open the covenant and the SS guy says, I'm uncomfortable with this Jewish ritual. 
And it's like, that's the most accurate thing. If you said, let's dig up the Ark of the Covenant, they'd been like, uh, it's a Jew thing. Like, let's not. Like, let's. And Himmler was always digging up ninth century German villages. And he's saying to Hitler, like, dude, Hitler, we found a mud village, mud huts, Germany, 900 AD. Amazing. And Hitler was like, okay. Rome, Roman Empire, a thousand years earlier, marble buildings, Germany, a thousand years later, mud huts, you're making us look like losers. Cut it out. Uh, and Himmler was always like, but I'm trying to uncover the real German spirit. And Hitler's like, I'm trying to make us look not like a bunch of some barbarians, right? Like the Italians are all like, look at our 5,000 year old Roman temple. And I mean, like, I don't know, 3,000 year old. And uh, Himmler's like, look at our 1,000 year old like mud village. It's so beautiful. They had pigs here. Or whatever. Yeah, like, they were so cool. And, and so, like, there was a ton of this kind of uh, occult stuff uh, that some of the SS guys were interested in. But it was uh, this really kind of, uh, Hitler sort of discouraged it. It was sort of weird. And, and, but, there, but, of course, the Nazis were into this, all this sort of rewriting of history to uncover the true story of the Aryans and how they had been subverted. You know, these buff white dudes came out of the frozen north 5,000 years ago, and it was all brown people that screwed them over, and that's why they're not in charge of everything or whatever, uh, right? So, I mean, there's this whole, there's this whole occult thing um, that, uh, that the Nazis are, like, big into, uh, right? And, and um, it's, all, it's all kind of ridiculous, right? Uh, there was, there's books you can read about the Nazis looking for the Spear of Destiny, which is the spear that the Roman legionnaire Longinius used to stab Jesus when he was um, on the cross, right? He's got the wound in his side. Uh, and, like, they probably did some of that, but it, again, like, why would you want a ritual or a relic that proves this like Jewish mythology to be true? You would you would rather have you know like like pagan stuff that proves the the validity of your of your weird Norse like beliefs or whatever, uh, right? And that's why the SS the SS the, the lightning bolts they look like runes on the on the the collars the, their little pins, um, and they use some of the some of the unit patches and stuff have like runic insignia in them. So yeah, that's 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 the answer to that. Um, there was a question earlier. Uh, is, did you ask Burgers syndrome named after a Nazi? I have no idea. I have no idea. I wonder about that. Um, they did do a bunch of medical research in yeah. the camps and stuff. Um, and the U.S. Army got all of the research and used it because they figured there's no other way to gather this data. The big thing, they tested um, high-altitude flight suits on Jewish uh, prisoners. And they would put them in like a hyperbaric chamber and lower the temperature and lower the pressure and then record their vital signs until they died. And so the U.S. government was like, wow, this is really useful because we, we want, kind of right, like we, we couldn't do this to somebody, but like since they did it and we could use this to fight the commies in, in the Cold War or whatever, so we, we use that stuff. Um, and they did like Mengele in Auschwitz tried to do like bone transplants and he tried to do all this kind of weird, creepy stuff. Uh, but I, I don't know anything about um, Asperger's. Yeah. Uh, so Mary wanted to know, was Hitler not a Christian then? Okay, so um, that's like super complicated. And hold on, drinks. Uh, oh my God, drinks. It's fine. It's fine. Real fine. It's fine. It's fine. We only had like a couple. And so, uh, the question is: Was Hitler a Christian? And uh, by implication, are the Nazis like a Christian group? I don't know. It's really complicated because the Nazis, um, Hitler himself, was, I think, like probably you would call him like a Christmas and Easter Christian. Like if you asked Hitler point blank. What is your religious identification? I think deep down in his heart of hearts, he did not care about religion. He didn't like, believe in any of that stuff. He certainly didn't describe to any of the moral codes of Christianity. Um, but on the other hand, he knew also that he came out of a Christian society. So you're not going to take over things by telling people that like you're not a member of the dominant faith. And this is, you know, I mean, look at America today where we've had 44 people be president of the United States of America. Because remember, Grover Cleveland, twice non-consecutive. Um, and every single one of them has gone out of their way to talk about how Christian they are. Even people that, for example, like, like Donald Trump, who displayed this sort of vague you know, indifference to religion, or Obama, who many people assume was totally an atheist, but because of political reasons, had to at least pretend to care about Christianity. You know, coming out of the African-American community where religion is, is a big deal. And so I think Hitler probably had the same circumstance where he was like, well, I can't just say religion's stupid. So I have to, like, at least pretend to care because Germany is overwhelmingly Catholic in the South and Protestant in the North. Uh, on the other hand, the Nazis uh, were a mix. Uh, the SS and Himmler were definitely anti-Christian. They definitely thought of this as being like a Jewish. After all, what is Christianity? But it's a Jewish ideology, right? It's a Jewish thing. It's a, Jesus, is a, Jesus is a Jew. Uh, right. Don't step on poor Fang. He's just trying to sleep in his little bed. Um, Fang, it's okay, Fang. It's okay. He's grumpy, but, uh, and so it's fine. He's being grumpy. And so, 
Um, you know, I mean, Jesus is a Jew, so you don't want any part of that, right? But on the other hand, the Nazis, when they took over Germany, they tried to um, uh, coordinate, is the term that they used, every, every institution in Germany. So your book club, we're going to bring in everybody. We're going to say, look, we liquidated the book club leader because um, they were not great. Uh, and now we're going to have new book club. Uh, we're a new book club. I liquidated the group. They were insolent. Um, and so we have new book club, which is Nazi book club or no book club pick. And of course, it's like one well, Nazi book. And it's like, cool, everyone's going to read Mein Kampf. It's the best book ever. I'm sure you'll love it. And so they basically took over every aspect of society. And for Hitler, a big part of that was the idea they were going to create a Nazi church, uh, right? It was called the German Confessional Church. Uh, but they never really never got off the ground. Obviously, as fake as is a three dollar bill, right? I mean, the, the actual believing Christians were not about to join a church that the the fascist dictator had founded, basically, right? Um, and so they it never really got off the ground, and it was so unpopular that the Nazis kind of just backed off of it after a little while. So I would not call the Nazi movement um, either inherently Christian or non Christian. I would say it's sort of a mixture of the two, right? Um, and there were Christians who were persecuted by the Nazis. Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, uh, were persecuted, although the German government didn't recognize the Jehovah's Witness as a, a religion that could legally be practiced in Germany until like 2005 or something like that. Um, and there were Christians who died in prison, uh, among them uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was uh, and died in a Nazi prison camp. Although Bonhoeffer famously uh, regretted the fact that not that the Nazis were anti-Semitic, but rather that their extermination of the Jews would mean that you could not convert the Jews to Christianity before they went to hell for being Jews. So it's like, wow, way to be right about something for the worst reason. Um, and so, so the Nazis were sort of, it was sort of more complicated than simply they were the, the ultimate expression of radical Christianity, or which some atheists say, or alternatively, the, the Christian argument that Hitler was like just an atheist who left the church, right? It was never, it was never as simple as that. It was, it was sort of more complicated than that. The, the communists in Russia, on the other hand, were avowedly atheists. There's no question about that. And Stalin banned the Orthodox Church. They campaigned to counter religious education. They had the campaign for the militant godless, and they, they, they jailed church. Uh, at one point, uh, Stalin jailed like two-thirds of the Orthodox priests in Russia and executed like half of the ones in jail. And so, and he only legalized Orthodox Christianity when it became useful in World War II as a rallying point for, um, uh, for, the, for the Russian people, right? When it was sort of having to trot out an Orthodox priest and point a gun at him and say, tell everyone to do what I want or I'll kill you. And the priest was like, Stalin is okay, I guess. That became sort of useful, uh, right? But Hitler, I think it was, it was more complicated. And the, the Germans are, um, he sort of wants to weaponize Christianity or use it as a, as a tool of the Nazis, but he, he can't quite figure out a way to do that. Uh, we should mention the Catholic Church, by the way, uh, didn't totally protest very much because they were not super ups. I mean, hey, this guy's going to kill all the Jews. I like, mm, yeah, yeah, you know, like, all right. Uh, the, the Vatican published a newspaper called Observatore Romano, uh, the Roman Observer, and it was the most anti-Semitic newspaper in print until the Nazis started their own newspaper. So it's like not exactly like, hey, this guy's going to kill the Jews. Like, all right, we've been, we've been saying that for decades. So, you know, like, whatever, cheers. Um, and so, uh, you know, yeah, drinks. It was it, the the Italian um, uh, fascists were enthusiastically supported by the Catholic Church, but they didn't quite have the same kind of religio kind of occult component that the um, the Nazis really did. Uh, right? Mussolini was much more orthodox, just like I'm Italian, we're Catholic, that's it. Uh, right? Uh, he viewed the Catholic Church as a competing power center, not as like an ideology that threatened fascism in Italy the way that Hitler was uncomfortable with Christianity. Right. So, is there, are there more questions? No, Brittany was just commenting that she's already drunk too. All right. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Brittany, who is our top fan. So, are you a top fan? Do you have a top fan badge? That's true. You guys are. That's true. You guys are here, so you probably would have a top fan badge if you were commenting. But when I enabled top fan badges this afternoon, uh, Brittany was awarded one. Um, so, Karen. oh, Karen is a top fan. Cheers to Karen, also a top fan. Um, so uh, Karen is pretty great. And so uh, let's talk about the Hitler's trial, right? The Hitler trial. So Hitler goes on trial, and it's this like farce. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and before you get to Hitler's trial, Sean, um, I want to say it's Mary's brother. He said, yeah, I can't wait till we get to Wagner and Art in general. I mean, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, Hitler was a big Wagner fan, and when he lived in Munich as, uh, no, no, when he lived in Vienna as a young man, 
after his mom and dad died and he moved out of the house, he um he he couch surfed with a dude named um August Kubitschek. And Kubitschek's dad had bought them an apartment or rented them an apartment in Vienna somewhere in the downtown. And Hitler basically slept on the couch um, and he saved all of his money. He had like a, a pension from the Austrian government because he was an orphan. And uh, dude, Olivia, don't throw that the clod of cat hair in the clean towels. Um, so rude. Um, so uh, anyway, Hitler saved all of his money to go to uh, Wagner operas. And um, Wagner is this, uh, Richard Wagner is this uh, 19th century operatic uh, German musical composer. He wrote uh, Der Ring des Nibelungen, his greatest work, his masterpiece. The Ring is an opera that tells the epic story of the Norse myths, um, Siegfried and uh, the, the Rhine River um, and the dragons and uh, the whole thing. And it's, it, it's, when it's done on stage, they do it over like five nights. It's it's like a it's like a thing. I have a CD that's selections from the uh, from the ring, and it's a two disc best of. Um, and so and they do it on stage in like two nights. They they pick like the um the best parts. Um, and the the best part, my favorite part, is the theme of the Rhine. So if you if you there's a there's a dwarf um whose name I can't remember, but he's a cripple, and he makes all of the magical artifacts. He makes Siegfried a spear, and Siegfried to get to him has to sail down the Rhine River, which is like the gateway between the the realms. And um, uh, what is the dwarf's name? I can't remember. Uh, um, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll look it up afterwards. But anyway, um, the uh, Wagner, he also did Tristan und Isolde, which is this, this opera. I think that's Wagner. And he did, uh, uh, no, that's, that's too Russian. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a Tolkien-esque kind of name because Tolkien used the same, same, um, the, same, uh, the same roots, uh, same language. So anyway, uh, Wagner... Uh, the, the Meister Singer, what's that? Um, e Tree? No, because that's the dude who makes Thor's hammer. I, I'll, it's not, I'll remember it later. Um, he has a whole theme in the ring where he appears on stage and um, um, and um, and like you know, is like he makes items for Siegfried. So anyway, um, uh, the Hitler's favorite piece of music, by the way, was Der Meister Singer, uh, which was a, a Wagner uh, piece. So anyway, Wagner set out in the 19th century to try to give the Germans a uh, musical and um, literary and kind of mythological tradition like the Greeks and the Romans had. The Greeks and the Romans have like Zeus and Theseus and Perseus and Aeneas and the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid and all the Greek myths. The Germans kind of didn't have that sort of mythological past. Their, their old gods that they had worshipped in the Bronze Age had kind of been sort of displaced. And all they have is Christianity, which is this like cultural import. Right, it, it's not. It's not really a German thing, and so he wrote these operas. He wrote the Ringis Nibelungen, uh, the Nibelungen Lied, and he wrote, uh, which is the Nibelungen Lied, is a, is the poem, is the medieval poem, and he wrote an opera of the poem to try to give the Germans a set of their own stories. And of course, the Nazis loved Wagner because um, he um, he had uh, this. Um, he sort of provided them an alternative to Christianity. Right, he, he provided them. Uh, an alternative sort of set of stories that were not like a Jewish myth, right? And so um, the um, uh, and every year, by the way, the um, uh, there's a, f a festival in Wagner's hometown Bayreuth uh, where they they do his music. Uh, yeah, I mean, look up look up the, the the ring of the the look up the ring saga. The ring is Nibelungen. I mean, is it the drop here? Is that the ring you're talking? No, no. Well, the ring is the name of the whole saga. Uh, yeah. What is it called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Itri is the guy in the comics who they and they stole him directly from the North. I forget the name of the dwarf who's in the ring. He's, he's, he's a different guy. Uh, but anyway, I mean, don't worry about it. It's not the hugest thing. Um, I'll go bust out my CDs later and listen to them. Um, and so um, there's a big festival here in Bayreuth where they celebrate Wagner's artistic genius and this sublime thing. And his his uh, daughter, uh, Winifred actually is a devout Nazi. Like, she's a big Nazi fan, right? Um, and so um, there is this big aesthetic component to Nazism where Hitler thought that, like, the cultural expression of German art should be rethought of to be removed from the kind of Judeo-Christian sort of zone as, as that was sort of not original to the Germans. Yeah. Albrecht. Uh, uh, Albrecht? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so there's your dwarf, right? Um, and so... 
Um, and, and, and so, um, uh, like Hitler was an, always thought of himself as an artist, right? Uh, he, he was, he went to art school. He tried to go to art school as a young man and failed. And the most, the shittiest thing anyone's ever said is it's 1945. It's April. He's about to kill himself. The, the Russians are closing in on Berlin. And he says, he dictates this last will and testament where he's like, everyone has failed me. I'm awesome. No one else is great. This is not my fault. You're a bunch of losers. You deserve everything is getting, you're, is coming to you. And he said to, I want to say Garibles or something, um, that if, uh, if I had been allowed to go to art school, none of this would have ever happened. Uh, which is like, holy shit. That's like the, the shittiest thing anyone's ever said to another person, right? Uh, and then, yeah, like the, Olivia, can you stop rolling the ball that's the cat toy because it's really loud? Oh, because she's got her cat ears on and you're a cat, right? Is that what it is? You know, can you just play with a different cat toy? What about the snowflakes? Thanks. Um, oh my god, they squeak. Okay, can we play with a quiet cat toy? That's that's the best one, yeah. And so, um, Hitler was very interested in art and artistic representation, um, and he very much, when the, the Nazis take over, he um, they banned all art that was um, modernistic, like Impressionism, Cubism, Dadaism, Surrealism, they banned it all. They had a, a Reich art chamber that to practice art, you had to be admitted to that, and of course you had to be ideologically conformist in order to do so. Um, and they promoted this kind of really extreme kind of um, uh, neo um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, romantic art and like neoclassical art that was, it was very much a throwback to, to pre-modern art. It was very much a, 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 um, opposed to kind of modern art. Uh, and Hitler, he always saw himself as an artistic person. And the term in Germany for artist is, uh, art is Kunst. And the term for an artist is Kunstler. And a Kunstler is not, in America, we just like artist is how you translate it in English. But it really means like a bohemian, like a person who lives an artistic life and is concerned about like art and like appearances and aesthetics and stuff. And Hitler saw himself in that way. And his, his flunky for a long time was Albert Speer, who was an architect. And Speer successfully got a job with Hitler in the, like, in the 30s by showing up and doing designs for all of the monuments that Hitler was going to build to the Nazi government. But he drew them in ruins. Like he was like, this is what they're going to look like in the year 3000 when the Nazi government will, you know, like, like, like you can go visit the Roman temples today. And it's, it's very romantic, uh, if you know romantic art, it's a very romantic thing to go visit the ruins of the, the uh, Roman Forum and to meditate on the greatness of ages past. And here's his spirit saying, the future people are going to do the same thing about the Nazi. And Hitler was like eating it up with a spoon and he hires Speer to be the armaments minister. And they put Speer in jail in Nuremberg for having used slave labor to keep the German armaments industry running. And uh, I'll tell you the story. Uh, Speer gets cancer and they're going to let him out of jail because it's like a compassionate thing. So they let him out of jail in like 47. He's only served like a, a year in prison and he gets cancer treatment and lived in like the 70s. That's so, okay, well, I mean, like whatever. Um, and so uh, it's the Hitler trial. Um, drinks. Drinks. So we might have to do some creative uh, bouncing around. Here's my phone has 10% battery left. I mean, I have a phone um, that has battery. Um, it's fine. Um, and so, I mean, we've been, well, wow, it's, we've been doing this for an hour. And so, um, yeah, yeah, so, wow. Um, so anyway, uh, having said that, the Nazi trial, first of all, the judge is like openly sympathetic to Hitler, right? I mean, he's like, oh, Mr. Hitler, you're so great. And imagine, like I always say in class, like imagine if O.J. Simpson comes in and like you're accused of killing your wife and Ronald Goldman. And the judge is like, juice, man, you know, I got a tattoo of your face. Like you didn't do it. But anyway, and of course, like you can't, that's not a fair trial. I mean, it's insane, right? And the judge basically says to Hitler, like, you're a good guy. and You're just trying to do the right thing. And. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, and so, and he gives Hitler the opportunity to basically testify, um, uh, um yeah, uh, uh, metal boy's name was, um, and so he basically gives Hitler these opportunities to testify where, uh, like Hitler is allowed to take the stand and instead of having someone ask him questions, the, the judge is just like, say whatever you want. And Hitler goes on at length about, like, blah, 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 the Jews, blah, 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 the Nazis, blah, blah, you know, and, and goes off in these rants, which serve to introduce Nazism to people at large in Germany in 1923. I mean, everybody's reading these in the newspapers. The reporters are, like, transcribing his statements and putting them in the newspapers, right? And so Hitler gets, um, Ludendorff goes on trial, too, because he's, like, a ringleader. He has to be as a general, right, or whatever. And so the funny thing is, at the end, they convict Hitler 
of all of uh, like a bunch of the charges and Ludendorff gets off scot-free because the judge is like, yeah, there's no evidence that you did anything other than just like lend your credibility to the to the the thing. And Ludendorff stands up and is like, I am outraged that you would not think that I am in charge. And the judge is like, oh, my God. Is it OK? Just just bend this one. This 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 has to go, it has to go like, like that. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. It's fine, right? <laughs> is it still connected? It is still connected. All right, whatever. It's fine. Um, earthquake. It's like it's like original Star Trek where you get hit and everybody on the, the bridge is like. So, um, uh, Ludendorff. Um, did you see it? Uh, wild. Um, so it's like t today when I was recording for my class where I had the cat. Uh, the cat gets up on the desk and just walked in front of the camera with the tail across the screen for like a minute. So Ludendorff gets up and is outraged and was like, "How dare you not?" And the judge is like, "Look, bitch." If you want to go to jail, then I will. Then like I can charge you. You could be. And Luna was like, "No, nah, it's, it's I didn't do anything or whatever." Um, and so he basically just like like just like diminishes and goes away forever. And so Hitler goes to this prison called Landsberg Prison, and they call it Fortress Confinement. What we would call it today is like minimum security, nonviolent offender, supervised release. <laughs> right? He goes to this old prison, Landsberg Prison. And they give him a, a two-room cell. He's got a bedroom and a private bathroom and, like, a sitting room in his cell. And he's allowed to have visitors, no big deal, anytime. The door is unlocked. Um, he can go in and out. of the, He can go to the prison anytime he wants in the public areas of the prison. There's, like, an exercise track and a garden and stuff. And he can leave the prison on weekends if he promises to come back, when, like he does. And uh, he's got this clunky Rudolf Hess who takes him out every weekend and they go out and like, they go stay at people's houses and they go camping and stuff. And then it's, it's sort of like completely not serious. And Hitler's a model inmate. He's, everyone loves him. He's very nice. And when he leaves prison, I think 18 months or something, um, um, they, they throw a party and everybody like comes to the party and they kind of throw Hitler going to a party and Hitler caters it. Um, he gets money and caters the party and they bring in like, they, they brought him a cake. He likes German chocolate cake and he's a sweet tooth. And he throws, he like brings in the food. He like pays to have the, the party catered. And everyone is like sad. They sign a get well card. Like you were such a nice man, Mr. Hitler. Like you're so, you're so great. And it was like, it's just been so great being here with you guys. You're so wonderful. Like you were such, so nice to me. And it's like, this is supposed to be like prison for, for, for jail, right? Uh, 1888. <laughs> so uh, it's 1888. So uh, uh, give me a phone. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you don't know my password, it's the year Louis the Fourteenth died. Don't say that to everybody. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, Olivia, for real. Okay. Uh, and so um, Hitler goes back into politics. The Nazi Party gets banned for a certain amount of time, and they end up um, they end up actually flouting the ban. And um, uh, like sort of operating quasi legally, and um, uh, Hitler like he, he sort of moves to take over the party. It's been kind of in under new management while he's been in prison. Olivia, I swear to God, stop it with the balls, with the, the toys, please. Just play with something that's not a loud cat toy. Thank you. And so um, Hitler has to kind of take over the party, and this is a defining moment in Nazi party history because. Um, Hitler makes the party a lot more right wing, uh, right? They still have this vaguely left wing um, like ideology, the Nazi party program, the 14 points is what it's called, 12 points or whatever. And Hitler like moves to basically undercut all of that. And he much more aggressively courts an alliance with right wing political figures and also um, big business. And, and they, the, the, till the end of the, the Third Reich, the Nazi government, they technically have the um party program as their like official platform but it it's it's like it's never officially like they don't do any of that stuff right it's like it's technically what they're about but in practice they're not remotely about it right and so the nazi party becomes a, a lot more of a um of a um a right-wing party uh right and and so the nazis compete electorally hitler always said uh, he said the moment that uh, uh, we were defeated, I knew that I had to go into politics and I knew I had to be become a, a mainstream party. And it's like, eh, whatever, you're probably lying. But um, 
they began to compete in, elect, in electoral politics. And as the Depression got bad and the economy in Germany got bad before the Depression, it got worse. The Nazis actually did quite well. They won um, not a majority, but like a pretty sizable percentage of the vote in a bunch of elections. Um, and so they were able to compete quite successfully. Uh, but what happened that was really disastrous is that the economy began to turn around in the early 30s. And the Nazi support for the Nazis kind of dried up. You don't need crazy, extreme, radical solutions when the mainstream kind of moderate parties are capable of providing those, an those, those answers to you. You just don't need it, right? And so uh, the, the very fateful thing that happened with the Nazis is that they, um, the right-wing kind of conservative mainstream parties, they viewed Hitler as like a useful person. He had this big mass following. He's this famous guy in Germany. Uh, one of the Nazi campaigns for uh, the, the elections, Hitler, uh, they called it Hitler über Deutschland, Hitler over Germany. And he flew around the country in a plane. And every stop, they had a Mercedes waiting for him that they would like drive really fast to the new stop. And he would jump out of the plane into the Mercedes, photographed, of course, by the press. And he would zoom off to a campaign address two in a day. And so he, he campaigned in places that no political candidate had ever gone in like rural parts of Germany twice a day. Uh, he would, he would, you know, get in his car and like zoom off uh, down the road um, and, uh, and be photographed doing it. And so Hitler had this mass appeal that the old mainstream conservatives didn't think that they had. So they thought they could kind of use Hitler. They thought they could bring him into the government and give him like a shitty job as like minister of like, you know, education or something irrelevant or whatever. What? Yeah, I mean, whatever. And then his, his followers would vote for their, their parties. His followers would coal form a coalition government with the conservative parties, and, and they would be able to kind of use him. Uh, and the, the, the big guy is uh, Kurt, uh, I want to say it's Schleicher, who is the, the former general turned right-wing political leader, who is sort of the mainstream conservative, who thinks, like, I can just use Hitler like a puppet, right? I can just, you know, get him to, he want any power I can give him, right? And of course, this is not the first guy and certainly not the last guy to underestimate Hitler, right? Hitler, once Hitler gets in the door and gets a position in the government, he immediately, he doesn't take a job in the government. He lets his flunkies be appointed. They, uh, most famously, they appoint Hermann Goering as um, uh, police commissioner of Prussia, which would be like appointing, you know, noted gangster Al Capone as like head of the FBI or something. Uh, well, I mean, like, ooh. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, yeah, noted, noted uh, charter school advocate, advocate Betsy DeVos is Secretary of Education, right? Or, or noted, noted um, uh, oil energy state producing uh, polluter supporting Scott Pruitt is your EPA director, right? Um, and so uh, Gehring is like the last guy you want in charge of the cops. But for Hitler, it's like a toe in the door. And of course, once you're in control of the cops, like you have a lot of power. All of a sudden, Nazis stop getting prosecuted for crimes, right? And all of a sudden, left-wing violence starts being the order of the investigative, uh, you know, uh, uh, priority. Like we got to really crack down on these communists and be like, "What about the Nazis? Oh, I think you're misunderstanding the, you know, I don't think it's as bad, or you're just you're a left-wing guy yourself, or whatever, right?" And so they're good. They're just good people on both sides. Okay. It's just, it's just, they're just, I mean, their heart is in the right place. Okay. If they shoot some Nazi or the commies or whatever, I mean, who could be upset at a bunch of commies being killed in an alley or whatever? I don't know. And so uh, having said that, um, um, once you kind of get in the door, you're able to sort of like shape what goes on the government. And so the fateful moment comes where the conservatives are so afraid that they will lose control of the government that they decide to um, to simply uh, after an election invite Hitler to be the chancellor. Yes. Yes, that that one has a bell, like a bell, it, like rattles. Yeah. Can I have it? Thank you. Yeah, it's a kitty toy. Back up. You can catch it. Um. So anyway, um. Uh, the, and then Hitler sort of doesn't take over. The government in the sense of like seizing power he is invited to become the chancellor he's invited into the government and there's a very famous picture that shows chancellor hitler being sworn in after these years of the political wilderness and he's walking up and he's shaking the hand of reich president paul von hindenburg who is the member of the general from world war one and hindenburg was hitler's old commander when he was in the army and so hindenburg is this old dude who is totally out of it he's in his 90s he doesn't really understand he's got dementia he doesn't understand anything so he's just like he does the job he gets in the uniform and, and hitler comes up and shakes his hand and the picture is the two of them side by side and hitler bows 
uh, to Hindenburg, which he never, never does in, he, in his life, but he bows to Hindenburg. Hindenburg is his old commanding uh, officer from when he was in the German army in World War I. And so what the Nazis do after they seize power is they wait for an opportunity. And there was a fire in the German parliament, the Reichstag, and it was probably started by a, um, a cleaning guy who left turpentine-soaked rags on a heating vent, on a, um, uh, like a furnace vent. Uh, although when the fire burns out in the Reichstag, Goering shows up in his, in his Mercedes and he leaps out waving a Browning pistol. And he's like, we got to start rounding up the Jews. This is, this is the communists are coming in. They're going to take over everything. This is, uh, this is the beginning of the revolution that they're coming to get us. And um, it's completely you know, not, but they're able, the Nazis are able to portray it as this like, this like serious thing, right? And, and um, yeah. yeah. Stephanie wants to clarify that this is Hindenburg before or after the crash. Uh, oh, the blimp? Yeah. Um, I think it's after. The crash is like in New York in the 20s. Yeah, yeah that's where they recorded on film, and you can hear the guy saying, oh, the humanity, because like the, the, the like, a like 200 people died, right? Um, and so like not a great – like th there was this weird moment in history where zeppelins were like a thing. And if you, if you, if you know like uh, – what's that? Uh, ooh, yeah, lead con, the lead con. Uh, but like if you know like, like in steampunk and, and like sci-fi – the way to, to make a world seem otherworldly is to uh, just like pan away to a city and have like a Zeppelin overhead. Cause like we don't have them at all like the Goodyear blimp. Right. But like for a minute in the teens and twenties, there was like this whole idea that like we were all going to travel on lighter than air balloons across the Atlantic ocean forever. And it was like, no, right. We're not, we're, we're not going to do It's stupid. Uh, but like that was what the Hindenburg was like, it was like a big thing. They named it after him as like a prestige thing. And then of course it blew up and burned down. And it was like in New Jersey or someplace. It was the, the, like, like in, yeah. Cause they, they, they catch them on big, they have a big tower and they drop a, um, they, the, the Zeppelin like runs into the tower and like launches into it and they drop ropes and they, everybody grabs the ropes and they pull the Zeppelin down, um, onto the, uh, uh, the um, uh, the ground, and I think I want to say the Empire State Building had a Zeppelin landing pad on the roof when they built it because the Zeppelins are cool. And like a year later, they were like, and they got rid of it, right? Um, so if you want to know more about Zeppelins, read your Thomas Pinchon against the day uh, has a whole bunch of stuff, like a three hundred page discussion about Zeppelins in a thousand page book. Anyway, um, and so Hindenburg, and, and, like sort of, they invite the Nazis in, and there's this fire, and Hitler uses this as the pretext to pass a law that would suspend the Constitution. And you got to understand that the, the Weimar government had done this a bunch of times, right? Like they had a, a gridlock problem like we have and their solution was just to sit down and say, okay, we have like a budget problem or we have this problem. We're never going to solve it. So what if we just flip this switch and turn off the constitution and then we let the government fix the problem and then we just turn the constitution back on. And as long as you trust the people doing it, you know, to only do that, it works, right? But it's not a really great precedent because the Nazis made the case in 33, they're like, guys, we got to turn the constitution off. We got to exterminate these communists that need to destroy the fabric of our society. And then we're totally going to turn the constitution back on, we promise or whatever, it's fine, right? And so the government gives Hitler emergency powers to handle this threatened communist uprising, which never happens. Um, and the Nazis never give the powers back. And now Hitler's the dictator of, of, of Germany. And they, the Nazis refer to this, the, the, the period of time where they get rid of their opponents and seize power, they call the Machtergreifung, the seizure of power. And they really, they purge the government of undesirable people. They crack down on Jews, liberals, communists, labor organizers, anybody they don't like, pacifists, anybody. And all those people end up getting, they spring up these kind of pop-up, uh, concentration camps and they like deport people in the woods and beat the crap out of them and shoot them and stuff and like as soon as everyone knows what's happening it's like it's already done it's already like your neighbor's already gone um and, and the government's already sort of doing all this bad stuff um and it happens uh the great example is uh it, it, i want to say uh was it uh, isaiah berlin whoever said uh that um uh, things happen very slowly and then all at once and that was sort of how the Nazis did it. They sort of, they inserted themselves into power gradually. And then all of a sudden they were like in charge of everything. And of course the big thing is they got the cops, they got the judges, they got the courts, and then they could kind of do whatever they wanted. They could prosecute people for crimes they made up. Uh, their people could never be prosecuted because it was all totally legal. Um, and, and the military and the right wing people and the, the, the businesses, they looked on and let this happen because they thought it was going to be good for them, right? The Nazis are going to make Germany strong. We're going to be able to push off the Versailles Treaty. Uh, the companies are looking at uh, the contracts and business, and they're going to get a government that is in tune to what they want. Hitler wanted to rearm the government. If you're Kruppstahl, 
or you're the you know Mercedes or the car companies, you like this. And so everybody thought they could play Hitler for their own advantage. Everybody thought they could get something out of this. And so they went along with it, right? And after all, they're just going to get rid of people. That you are, I mean, Jews, who, doesn't, who likes those people? Come on. I mean, whatever. They're going to get people. Communists? I mean, no, whatever. It's fine. And, of course, uh, as the saying goes, like, they came for these people, and I didn't care, and they came for these people, and I didn't care, and, they came for these, and then they came for me, and nobody was left, right? And by the time it got around to the fact that we're like, holy shit, they might actually start shooting people for disagreeing with Hitler, it's like, well, you know, it's a little late to complain about that, uh, right? And so it was a very... It's not calculated. Well, it's, there's a huge argument about did Hitler ca- plan this? And I think he always just very carefully reacted to events. But it was it sort of it was it was playing a, a hand of cards dealt to randomly in some ways in the best way possible, um, right? It's sort of uh, reacting in the best, most advantageous way to events on a consistent basis, um, right? Um, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so should I have to up and keep this to be about the Nazis as, about, as opposed to about World War II? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Brittany had asked, so what year were the Nazis defeated and none ever existed again? Okay, so in 1945, uh, the, the April, uh, the, remember, the, the, we invade um, uh, 1944, uh, June, D-Day, French-American invasion. It's, it's actually not, it's British-American and Canadian, uh, France. The Russians come from Russia east, uh, going west, and we kind of just squash Nazi and Germany in the middle. Um, the um, it's April 1945, where hey, come on, and so uh, the, um, the 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 they catch the, the Nazis in the middle, and uh, there's the big Russian battle for Berlin, and uh, Eisenhower is able in late April to send a telegram to FDR, uh, it's Truman at that point, because FDR has died of his, his 83rd heart attack. Uh, and he says, uh, at like, you know, 0645 hours on April, whatever, the Allied Expeditionary Force in, in, in Europe completed his mission. And they, um, uh, they occupied Germany. And what the Allies did is they banned the Nazi party, they dissolved the state of Prussia, and they totally liquidated the German government, uh, pending some kind of, of reformation. You want me to wear that instead? Yeah. Okay. I'm doing a trade. That's fine. I will wear these. Yeah, Hitler commits suicide in the bunker, and then the, the Germans, the Russians, they take over Berlin. Uh, and uh, he uh, burned his body. They, they burned his body. The SS burned his body. And the Russians caught it and put the fire out, took the body back to Moscow. And in, like, the 60s, they um, they cremated it. Yeah, and then they, they had his skull in, like, a jar for a while, and then they, they cremated it. It's gone, apparently. Dumped it in a river. Yeah, they just they threw it in want, one, and they don't want to, yeah, they don't want to, they didn't want to be, like, a monument or anything so, like that. Yeah. And so... Technically, the Nazi party is outlawed in modern-day Germany. The foundation law of the modern German government, uh, the, the two German governments uh, in the in the in '49, you have the uh, People's Republic. Oh no, no, is the German Democratic Republics, Eastern Germany, Communist, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, uh, Democracy, Capitalist, and then in 1980, oh, yeah. when. Um, and so the, um, the, the West German state absorbs the East German state and the new foundation law of the West German state and now modern day Germany, they ban the Nazi party. The fascism, Nazism is illegal. And, um, they're even very strict about display of the Nazi, um, uh, symbols and imagery and ideology. So there's a lot of like Nazi adjacent stuff that right wing Germans use to kind of get around that. And, um, recently they've had problems with the Nazis in, um, in the German military, which has this kind of surprisingly right-wing culture. Um, and they, they, they've said they've had issues with that over the past couple of years. But technically, Nazism is illegal in, um, in Germany today. 
Um, although you can believe those things, um, it's just you can't necessarily, there could be no Nazi political party. Oh. And so the, the allies kind of banded after World War um, II. I need to know if any of them are actually still getting. Um, yeah, are you hearing any of this? Anybody? Anything? Anything? Bueller? Bueller? No. Bueller? <laughs> is anybody hearing it? Uh, uh, I don't know. Nobody has commented that they're actually hearing it yet. They're talking about beer. Yes. Okay. Sarah just said that she can hear us. Okay. So is it Sarah, Sarah, Sarah and Ashley have both just said yes, they can hear us. So okay. you're good. This is Sarah Knight. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Sarah Knight. The big ups. Sarah Knight. You're, you're the best. Um, and have this little bit you're not going to be allowed to talk for too much longer though, because my arm is going to get tired because I don't I know how to rotate your, your camera. Um, it's you swipe down from the menu and there's a little button you press. Sure. Um, Hi, everybody. It's Sarah. <laughs> it's okay. my very messy house. Uh, whatever, it's fine. Uh, it should rotate now. I unlocked it. Mommy, it's my, Mommy, it's my turn. It's my turn. It is not. Okay. Tim, so, um, is is there is there other questions? Did you really have other questions? Someone have other questions? Uh, Evan had one about the Illinois Nazi. I don't know if that was the Illinois Nazi. Well, there were American Nazis. There were Nazis in other countries. The um. Oh, the American Nazi Party was headed by George Lincoln Rockwell, um, and he ended up basically as a figure of fun uh, around World War II because obviously American Nazis lull. Uh, although they did have a big rally in Madison Square Garden in the 30s, um, and um, the um, the British had their own Nazi Party, the British Union of Fascists, which was headed by Sir Oswald Mosley. And actually, um, the there are uh, a series of sisters in uh, England called the Mitfords. And they were um, they were these wealthy upper class, like pretty um, women who uh, were like literary figures. And uh, one of them, Nancy Mitford, wrote a series of very good biographies. She wrote about uh, Voltaire, Frederick the Great, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, Madame de Pompadour. And her sister, I forget which one, married Sir Oswald Mosley, who was the head of the British Union of Fascists. And also, the upper classes in England were surprisingly sympathetic to Nazism. They thought of sort of like, oh, the Nazis are just sort of, you know, these good chaps trying to make Germany sort of strong, and you can kind of sympathize with them. And after all, the Jews were just kind of, you know, very good, sort of, you know. And Germany great again. Yeah, you know, kind of like that kind of stuff. And and in fact, um, Edward the uh, the, the seventh was the British king who um, who uh, um, was. Um, uh, he married Wallace Warfield Simpson, who was the American divorcee. It was a big no, although funny story, American American yeah, divorcee is not so bad anymore. But Edward married. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, Evan has told me never to say his comments. Okay. Uh, Edward married the American divorcee again. Not a weird thing today, Meghan Markle, but but um, he actually was openly sympathetic to Hitler. He was like, this Hitler guy is fine, like Germany. And of course, it was a weird like a lot of British people were horrified that this basically Nazi loving guy would become the head of state, which is why it was great when he married the divorcee. They packed him off, and his brother became king of England during World War II. Okay, a couple questions. Stephanie wants to know why the Russians have Hitler. Um, when the when Hitler killed himself, it was in Berlin, and the Russians took over. Berlin was in the agreed upon Russian zone of Germany that they agreed upon in the early 1945 Yalta Conference. So uh, the Russian army was the one that captured the bunker, the Führer bunker. So they were they found Russian troops allegedly found his burning body and smothered the flames and took it. Um, is this is the story? There were no American troops in Berlin. We didn't go to Berlin. We stopped at the Elbe River, which is more to the west. Okay, so Brittany wants to know, what do you know about the medical experiments that were conducted by the Nazi party on prisoners? Yeah, so at the, at the, in the camps, they had doctors. And when you would come into the, the, the camp, they would undergo a process called selection. And basically what they would do is they would divide men on the left, women on the right. And kids, young kids go with your, like your mother, uh, uh, older kids, you, your mother or father, older kids, you, you get sorted into like you're a boy or a girl. And, 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 and some of the doctors would conduct experiments on prisoners they would pull out of the, um, the, the, the lot. And when, they, when you got off the, the cattle cars and they were doing the selection, they would pull people who were too old or too sick right out of the line. And so infamously, the doctor at Auschwitz was Joseph Mengele. And Mengele would walk down the line of people and be like, live, live, die, live, die, live, live, die, live, die, die. And if you said live, you got shoved into the camp where you sorted by gender. And if they said die, they would just shoot you or throw you to the gas chambers immediately. And so Mengele told the guards, always be on the lookout for like a certain subsets of people he's interested in. And they would pull them out and he would perform medical experimentation on them. 
he was interested. They, they did uh, for the German military. They did the aforementioned experiments in um, um, uh, high altitude stuff for like bomber pilots and fighter crews and stuff. They also tried to do bone transplants, which are just weird. And they tried to do all sorts of other stuff, uh, trying to do transplantation, which again was not a, not practical in the fifties and sixties in America with like heart transplants and stuff. And um, Mengele was also interested in identical twins. So they would pull identical twins out and he would hook them up to uh, apparatuses that would measure their life si uh, signs, their vital signs. And then he would like electrocute one twin to see if the other one felt any of the pain or anything. Um, and so it was this really kind of weird pseudoscientific stuff. And again, some of it was of, you might say, legitimate medical interest about like um, uh, the high altitude experiments, but it was conducted in an incredibly inhumane way. But of course the advantage that the Nazis had was that they had this ready-made pool of, um, of test subjects that could not say no, right? And, and in fact, would be glad to perform these experiments in return for privileges like food, uh, right? Um, and so there was a lot of that in the camps um, later on in, in the war. Um, you ready for the next question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, Jake asked, what about the conspiracy theory that Hitler escaped to Argentina? Right, so that comes from um, a series of stories where the Argentine government at the end of World War II issued a lot of visas to Nazis who were then able to get away from the collapse of Germany and hide out in Argentina in, until the 50s and 60s. And the most celebrated case was one of the organizational architects of the Holocaust, Adolf Eichmann, who was like, he was uh, in the Reich Security main office and he was responsible for, hey girls, girls go in the living room and, and take it down a notch for me, please. Or okay. right. And so uh, Eichmann was sort of like the, the organizational guy behind the Holocaust, right? And so Eichmann um, got away to Argentina and in the 60s, the Israelis discovered where Eichmann was and a Mossad team kidnapped him. They, they injected him with uh, sedatives and put him on a plane in a duffel bag and they flew him to Tel Aviv and they put him on trial. And so there was a famous novel called The Boys from Brazil about them cloning Hitler in the 60s. Uh, and it was in Argentina because he goes like Brazil, I guess, or whatever. And so there were all these stories, rumors of Nazis in South America. And there were some, but there's no evidence that Hitler ever got away. And in fact, the, the Russians provided fairly comprehensive evidence that they did, in fact, um, uh, catch Hitler and his uh, the, the body. And... Um, his suicide is well documented. He wrote a suicide note. He wrote a last testament to the German people and numerous witnesses like his secretaries. One of them was named Trau Ruge. And so uh, Trau Ruge talked about it and, and it sort of like described this. And uh, they found the bodies of some of the other Nazis who committed suicide with it, or Goebbels and his wife Magda and their six kids. They fed the kids poison and they took poison. Uh, and then so like there's pretty good evidence that Hitler did commit suicide and the Russians did get his body. Yeah. Okay, we're calling this lightning round. Um, talk about the Nazis rescuing people from the Japanese. Nazis rescuing people from the Japanese. That's what Heather Perry, the young blood, said. Well, um, in, in 1937, when the Japanese army uh, attacked Nanking and they did massacre about 300,000 people in Nanking, the, um, the German ambassador who predated the Nazi government but had been just accredited as a Nazi official was in Western Nanking and he created a safe zone where he allowed Jap uh, Chinese refugees from Japanese violence to get to the safe zone. And then he wrote exit visas for Chinese people to get away to like Singapore, India and other places. So that, that did happen. Um, and so the, the Nazi ambassador did save people from the Japanese army, the, uh, the, the Japanese army. Okay. Um, Kadil Fustro on YouTube asked about Nazis in Lapland. In Lapland, uh, the uh, so the the Finns went to war with the Russians and defeated them in 1940. And then after the they, they, the Russians came back and then they won the second round. And the Finns basically signed a treaty that recognized that like they had to do this so they would be just destroyed. And so as a consequence, the Nazis uh, viewed Finland as sort of vaguely hostile. And the, the the Nazis occupied Denmark and Norway. But the Swedes, to keep the Nazis out of Sweden, actually um, basically signed a treaty where they allied themselves with the Nazis and provided the Nazis with raw material, particularly coal and steel, uh, right? So there were Nazis in bases in Norway. There was a nuclear research facility at, I think, Trondheim, and the Nazis were super interested in it. And in 1940, when they took over uh, Norway, 
the British actually torpedoed the ship carrying all the research materials so that it sank and they didn't get it. But it was a big red flag that the Nazis actually knew about nuclear weapons development because they wanted to get the products of this research facility away to, to Germany. And so, yeah, there were Nazis uh, up north. I don't know that there was anything super exciting going on up there because it's frankly too cold and too difficult to really conduct large-scale military operations in Lapland. Like to point out that my relatives left Sweden in like the 1870s. So. Not, not <laughs> Nazis. And the Swedes were it was very cautious. They knew that if the Germans invaded, they would lose. So they made this deal to provide. And it worked out for the Swedes because the Germans paid for it. They paid cash for the steel. So the Swedes got like the best of all worlds. They were neutral. They didn't get invaded. And they made us some money dealing with the Nazis during the war. Uh, but, of course, uh, in, in uh, Scandinavia today, and particularly in Norway and Sweden, there are very vicious, very violent right-wing political parties that have this kind of historical legacy of anti-Semitic Nazi, Nazi ideology and behavior. And actually, Stieg Larsson, the author of the, um, the Millennium series, The Girl Who Played With Fire and The Girl With the Dragon Tattoo, he is a journalist in Sweden for a magazine, and he wrote a lot about right-wing fascist parties in Scandinavia. And the reason he never married his wife is because when you get married in Sweden, you have to publish your married name, your wife, your names, and your addresses in an official Swedish government telephone directory. And he didn't want his wife to be available for harassment by the Nazis that he wrote about. So he never married her, which is cool but weird, I guess, because when he died, he had unpublished books that technically she owned, but they were not married, so she didn't. And her, his family got them which is why they got published. Uh, but there's a very big Nazi scene in Scandinavia um, in the modern day, um, which people have talked about a lot. Okay, so Stephanie asked about books and, and movies and things like that. I'm gonna let you answer that later in the comments because I know you have a huge number of those. I mean, some of them mentioned Downfall is pretty good. Um, Europa Europa is pretty good. Um, Jojo Rabbit was sad, but was kind of satire and kind of funny. Um, the um, I was going to let you answer okay, that later. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, no, yeah, so there's a lot of those. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, Heather asked what was considered real science in the 1940s, <laughs> if what the Nazis was practicing was not real science. Well, I mean, some of it was. I mean, the Nazis developed the automatic rifle. They had incredible weapons technology. The, some of the Nazi machine gun, the Nazi machine gun in uh, G42 was based in M60. They developed the assault rifle, the um, uh, SCG-1943, uh, which is really looks like an AK if you've ever seen one. They developed excellent, excellent machine technology. Modern tanks are all related to, related to the Nazi tanks. Uh, the jet engine, the ME-262, the Messerschmitt 262 was the first use of a jet engine. The intercontinental ballistic missile uh, was used by the Nazis, the, the V-1 and V-2 buzz bombs. Uh, so some of that stuff was really on the ball. Some of the Nazi medical stuff was really like pseudo-scientific argle bargle. Um, and so it was really kind Maybe of nutty. Uh, but like, hey, let's see what happens. Right do this. Yeah, like bone transplants. Like, what? You know, like, was that even a thing, right? Uh, but like, again, their machine technology, their their chemical industries, their um, uh, some of that the, the engineering was was really good. So the war technology was good. Yeah, some of their weapons. We used the M60 into the, into the 80s. Uh, basically, a ripped off MG42. The AK-47 is a, a better version of the original German assault rifle. Uh, the, the jet engine, they, they were the first people to fly a jet plane in the history of the world. Uh, and again, the intercontinental ballistic, all the Nazi scientists at the end of the war, we rounded them all up and we said, here's the deal, we shoot you in the face or you go to Florida and build rockets for NASA. And they were like, uh, Florida? And so NASA is full of Nazi scientists. Werner von Braun is a Nazi, head of the rocket program. And the Russians always said, you got a guy to the moon. One Russian guy said to America, you won the space race because you had more Nazi scientists than we had Nazi scientists, <laughs> uh, which is a funny way to put it. But we did. There's a whole operation, Operation Paperclip, was the operation to go by name and find all these Nazi dudes and round them up before the Russians got a hold of them because we knew we would want their technology um, after the war. Okay. Um, uh, Sean's comment. Yeah, Sean wants to know what companies other than Hugo Boss did lots of work with the Nazis. Uh, IBM did uh, tabulating and information management work for the uh, camps. Uh, Hugo Boss made uniforms. Uh, the Volkswagen Beetle was originally designed by the German government as a uh, car to be sold, a cheap car to be sold to Nazis called the People's Car. Um, and which is where you get Volkswagen. Oh, it was through a Nazi organization called Strength Through Joy, Comfort Froda. Um, uh, IG Farben, uh, the chemical company, did a lot of work with them. Uh, Krupp uh, Stahl, the steel company that made guns and cannons, 
use slave labor at their factory in the Ruhr Valley um, to make uh, make weapons for the Nazis. So a lot of big industrial concerns dealt with the Nazis and profited immensely. And even if you were a mid-range business, when the Nazis took over the German government in the 30s, they were happy to have your support in exchange for you to, to like get rid of your Jewish competitors. Department stores, the Jews had a big department store presence in the department store market in the 20s. So you would just, the Nazis would pressure, you'd do it to the Nazis, you'd get buddy buddy with them. The Nazis would pressure your Jewish competitor to, to leave the country and sell the business to you for t a tenth of its value. And so a lot of department stores ended up going folding a lot of mid-range, what we would call small businesses in the United States, folded and ended up being sold to their competitors because Jews got pressured into doing that in the early 30s. So a surprising amount of that went on. But again, a lot of big companies had these kind of ominous historical associations with the Nazis because they, they you know, to survive in the 30s, they said, you know, they cooperated with the Nazis, but only had like Krupp like used Jewish slave labor at their factories to build guns, uh, right? And they they were they they Is that like Schindler. Yeah, and like Schindler run the factory where he used it as a clearinghouse to get refugees out, right? Yeah. He was like a good guy. A lot of other German businessmen took the, the slave labor and just like used those people. Like they're like workers you don't have to pay, right? And you can just starve them to death. And when you Prisoners shoot them, jobs. prisoners are jobs. And when you shoot them, they just, you get more. You just call, uh, you call the government and you're like, we need more workers. And they just give you another sh you know, shipload, a uh, uh, car, car load of, uh, of emaciated, starving Jewish prisoners that you can use to make like fuses for artillery bombs or like gunpowder, uh, you know, gunpowder into casings and, and bullets and stuff like that. If there's any accidents, yeah. I mean, what do we care? It's not like we're paying these people insurance. Um, I don't see any other questions. Hawk wanted to correct you that it was not interconnect uh, intercontinental. It was. Uh, uh, what did you say? Ballistic missile? Just ballistic missile. Yeah, yeah, they weren't intercontinental yet because the range was up. Although the V2 buzz bomb that did not go into production and except in limited amounts would have been intercontinental, but they did not make enough of them to really use them. Uh, the V1, which looks like a rocket, yeah, actually I mean, was was that which one hit London? That was uh, the V1. It yeah. looks like a it looks like a 50s sci-fi pointed space rocket. Yeah. The V2 actually looks like a kind of like a plane where it's got a long fuselage and wings and a tail and like a can, can the wings and the tail connect. Yeah. And that could have in theory had an intercontinental range, but they didn't get very many of them off the ground. And they made them in a place called Punamunda using slave labor. And actually, um, uh, yeah, the JFK's older brother, um, uh, Joe Kennedy Jr., actually flew in a mission in 1944 to bomb Pier where they were going to um, tow a plane full of explosives and drop it into the factory. And he got shot down over the English Channel and killed, if I remember correctly, uh, which is why he had his brother had to become president of the United States and not him because his brother died. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, technically the ones that the Nazis deployed, the V1, were, con were, were ballistic missiles that were not intercontinental range. That's true. I don't have any other questions, so okay. say whatever you want or wrap things uh, up. I mean, that's like, that's like we talked about the Nazis for all. So, um, what's that? Fuck, Fuck the Nazis. Nazis. Fuck the Nazis, they're pretty bad. Um, and so, uh, there's a whole other thing you talk about with denazification after the war, which was a really big problem, but we talk about the Cold War in West Germany sometime and talk about it then. Um, so as always, thank you for watching. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, uh, I guess you should say that. <laughs> uh, Brittany um, says, what's the story on Hitler's girlfriend? She wants to Ava Braun, Ava Braun. Ava Braun was, um, Hitler had a girlfriend who was, he had Guy She's Robble, just here for the food. Uh, Guy Lee Robble, um, and she was his, like, niece, and he got really obsessed with her, and she killed herself. Oh. And they hushed it up. It's like the 20s. They hushed it up because they didn't want Hitler to be associated with controversy. So uh, Guy Lee Robble gets, gets sort of off, I don't know her, and Hitler has this photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, who was his personal photographer that he basically had a retainer. And Hoffmann had an assistant, this cute blonde girl named Ava Braun. And Hitler got obsessed with Ava Braun. And their relationship is really weird because Hitler is not a sexual person at all. As far as we know, he did not have a sexual relationship with really anybody his whole life. But he needed a person to have for appearances, I guess, but also he liked the idea of romantic love and to have this relationship. So he developed this relationship with Ava Braun and it worked for her. She she was young, she idolized Hitler, she thought he was so powerful. She sort of, they had this really kind of weird relationship that worked for them. And so over the course of the 30s and 40s, they were together, but it was not public at all. No one knew about the fact that Hitler had a girlfriend. And when you visited Hitler, if you were in the know, Ava Braun would be there serving drinks and kind of laughing laughing in the conversation and sort of taking pictures and there's home movies of Hitler that she took that you can watch. 
Uh, but um, uh, if you were not in the know, she would just disappear. She would just go back to her room and read books or whatever. And that was sort of a thing. She was totally okay with having this kind of this sort of life that revolved around Hitler's emotional needs. And, and then they got married right before um, Hitler committed suicide. They were married, and then she took poison. Hitler took poison, and he shot himself. Um, and they they burnt, their bodies were burned together. Um, actually, but she ha there's a good biography of her you can get on Amazon, which is pretty good. And she had this life that they basically structured it to where she provided Hitler the emotional support that he needed. She was there when he needed him, and when he needed to be alone, she just sort of receded in the background. It was a, kind of a one way street. It was a it was a very one way relationship in that regard. But uh, yeah, she was his girlfriend and later wife um, for for a long time long time companion. Um, Sarah also asked if we could somehow. Uh, um, talk about the the modern day parallels and things like that but i feel like that's the whole yeah, class whole, by whole itself yeah, the, yeah but no i mean i understand i understand where you're coming from um sarah we'll revisit that topic i think at another time yeah <laughs> um and I, I think with that we've been live for an hour and 40, 40 minutes, minutes. <laughs> thank everyone for why i appreciate everyone watching um drinks drinks, drinks. My, i have a little time to go to wine okay and um, um, uh, if you uh, if you have a question or a comment, um, I will uh, uh, put it on the on this post or on the on the, the Facebook page, and I will attempt to answer your your question or comment uh, at some time this week. And also, um, if you have a topic you want covered, suggest as well, because I'm happy to do do viewer viewer suggestions. As long as you know something about it. As long as I know something about it. And if I don't, like I can find something out about it and then we can like do that like down the road. Uh, I got I got a lot of books to read in the, in the <laughs> office. So I could, it would be possible that I have a book about it and I could read it. All right, you say bye. Bye everyone. Can I